Good afternoon, sir. Tell us who you are. My name is Brian Forster, and I'm happy to be here um, in England, having been invited by Hugh Newman and uh, a couple of other people to speak about the elongated skulls of Paracas, Peru, as well as the prehistory of um, the city of Cusco. Uh, well, let's begin uh, where, uh, of course, you and I spent some time together um, in Peru, uh, where I've learned probably more in a, a couple of short weeks than I did in an entire lifetime up to that point. So thank you so much for that. Um, let's talk about the Inca, which have fascinated me again since, since boyhood, really, um, and beyond, pre-Inca. I'm thinking particularly in terms of the gigantic megalithic structures of Sacsayhuaman, um, Tiwanaku, uh, and indeed, you know, throughout what is considered to be the, the Inca world. Talk to me a little bit about your involvement with that. Well, basically, my first trip to Cusco about five years ago, I, was, I had a professional guide, and he told me that everything in Cusco, the Sacred Valley and surrounding area, was all built by the Inca um, out of stone. But what my amateur eye picked up was different styles of building. There was very rough construction right next to megalithic, very tightly fitting construction whereby you couldn't fit a human hair in the joints between the stones. And so I automatically started to suspect that my guide either was ill-informed um, or, or mainly that um, that wasn't the full story. I could see that the the megalithic stone constructions were much finer and I thought much older than Inca, so I started to suspect that uh, Cusco itself was older than the Inca civilization, and that's where my investigations began. Now, the, the indigenous peoples are, are, are rightly and understandably suspicious of uh, white Europeans and white gringos, um, but having spent a lot of time there yourself now, you're getting to the point where perhaps you're being allowed to hear and see some more of the folk law, the folk knowledge that perhaps lends to, to these suspicions you've had to get, get a bit of weight behind that. Well, <clears throat> yeah, basically with every succeeding trip to Cusco, I would try to find another guide because I'd learned, I felt I'd learned eno enough from the ones that I'd had and more and more I began to find those that had the indigenous knowledge and they were the ones who confirmed my suspicions and frankly stated that Cusco was at least 5,000 years old, if not older. The Inca have only been there since about the year 1200 AD. And so it was the indigenous knowledge um, starting to be backed up by scientific investigations that has made me conclusively know that uh, Cusco is much older than the Inca civilization. And, and when we talk about the Inca, um, again, you know, my, my <coughs> understanding of it stemming from, from childhood is that we're talking about uh, um, a, a large, a widespread tribal culture. It, but it's much more than that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, a, um, a confederation of tribes, perhaps is a better way of putting it, a corrupt confederation of people brought under the umbrella of, a, of a, 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 a benign dictatorship, perhaps, might be a good way of viewing it. Basically, what we know is that the Inca arrived in the Cusco area about uh, 1200 AD, maybe 1100 AD, from the Lake Titicaca area, and that's where we find other megalithic structures like Tiwanaku and other sites around Lake Titicaca. And they immediately became the dominant people in the Cusco area, not through force, but through the fact that they had superior knowledge of architecture, um, agriculture, metallurgy, etc. So it seemed like the so-called primitive people of the area readily accepted the Inca as not their rulers but as their guiding force and that is how the Inca were able to develop their civilization uh, by the time the Spanish arrived in 1532 the Inca civilization covered from Colombia in the north to the middle of what is called Chile in the south Pacific Ocean in the west to partially into the um, Amazon jungle in the east most of it done through alliances with other tribal people. When force was required, it was um, done. But the Inca would usually invite the adjoining um, civilization to, or culture to join in with them in this confederation. Um, but after four attempts, if, the, if these people didn't accept, then the Inca would conquer them. And as soon as the, at that point, opposing people 
drop their weapons, the Inca would immediately stop any aggression and then send in their equivalent of the, uh, of the U.S. Um, Army Corps of Engineers or their equivalent to improve the infrastructure, the roads, agriculture, water systems, etc. Because a happy people are productive. The Inca were very clever at taxation. So the more productive the people were, the more products that the Inca received. And you could almost go so far as to say, uh, um, I've read your book, uh, fascinating, you could almost go so far as to say that um, it was an early model of socialism in its truest form. Oh yeah, exactly. It was a reciprocal arrangement. Everyone benefited. Mm -hmm. yeah. And consequently, you, there, was, there was little, if any, rebellion. Uh, very little. There was one instance, um, one major instance of one tribal people that rebelled. Mm. But in general, um, most people were happy or much happier to be part of the Inca civilization than independent mm. at that point. So why do you believe that the, um, the Spanish managed with so few men in such a short space of time to wreak such damage to the Inca civilization? Well, the Spanish took advantage of uh, the fact that a civil war had been raging prior to their arrival. That was instigated by smallpox arriving, traveling through the native population from Panama, which was the main Spanish base, down through the population. Um, and so that caused probably about half of the population to have died by the time the Spanish showed up. And then the Spanish were able to take advantage of certain situations. The Civil War was between two Inca brothers, Atahualpa in the north and Huascar in the south. And Atahualpa wanted an alliance with the Spanish because they had horses and guns. So he thought by developing a relationship with the Spanish that he would be able to conquer the rest of the Inca civilization. Unfortunately, the Spanish had other ideas. They were solely there for, for gold. Well, th th that's certainly the, the official version, but, uh, but there is also, I believe, the, the possibility that they were sent there very specifically to make sure any sacred and ancient knowledge never got any further. Well, that as well, but that's, that's the nature of conquest. Indeed. By destroying a, a people's belief system, mm starting with destroying their most sacred structure, which was the Coricanche in Cusco, replacing it with a church, then automatically the people who would um, naturally go to their Holy of Holies would become easily indoctrinated uh, because they, you know, for hundreds of years, they'd be used to going to that one specific energy spot. And now it was a church. Um, what they also did is that the Inca had a system called the quipu, which were knotted cords, and that's where everything was recorded. Um, not s things like um, agricultural production, etc., uh, was uh, documented through these knotted cords, but also language was encoded. So the Spanish would collect those um, as rapidly as possible and burn them, and by doing that, destroy any written form of knowledge. And um, those were the two principal ways that they were able to um, to wipe out, and of course, persecu uh, persecution by um, introducing the concept of hell and eternal damnation if you didn't follow the rules of this new belief system called Christianity. Mm -hmm. I, was I was very taken with your uh, analogous, uh, <coughs> analysis of, of the way in which that the, the Inca essentially had three rules for conduct, which is be truthful, uh, be honest, and be uh, magnanimous. Mm -hmm. And the Spanish came along and turned that around. So, do not tell lies. You know, and they turned essentially a positive into a negative. Exactly. And that's that's kind of the overarching impression you get of, of I suppose, the Catholic Inquisition, which was to uh, threaten punishment if you don't obey, rather than just saying, "Look, let's all get along. We've been out and be kind to each other, and everything's going to be fine." So. Well, exactly, and, and you know, included in that would be this uh, the symbol of the serpent, mm -hmm. uh, the serpent to the Inca represented the subconscious and also wisdom, possibly eternal wisdom. But because of the Bible, it was turned into the evil thing that influenced people and steered them off in, a, in the wrong direction. And so the serpent symbol was destroyed wherever it was found. Luckily, it still does exist in many of the walls in Cusco. And the, 
The Inca belief system was never totally destroyed. Like with any indigenous culture, it went, the knowledge went underground, and so it still exists to, uh, to this day. What I'm trying to do is find the wisdom keepers that still exist and want to share that knowledge with the world so that people who visit from other parts of the world to Cusco can learn the true traditions, not uh, a story written by Western scholars tainted with Spanish, Catholic, you know, Western influence. And a noble aim. I, I wish you every success with it. Um, have you discovered in your in your investigations any actual written records or, or hints that there may still be written records anywhere? There still are. There's a system of, I just found that out in June uh, by staying with uh, David Childress. He had this tiny book written in Spanish that uh, showed that the Inca also had a hieroglyph system. Wow, okay. And so each hieroglyph, which is basically a square with a symbol inside, would represent one syllable of a word. And we still see that in the garments that um, survive of the royal Inca. They would wear language in, on their clothing. So that still exists probably mainly in museums in Spain, to some degree in Peru. Um, but the, the knowledge is there, and, and that's something I would like to research more. While we were traveling about, and, and when we were at, uh, um, uh, there's another site next to Saxe Woman. There were three in a row, and I forget which one it was, but there is a, an access, an alleged access to one of the tunnels there um, in a site that's got like a, a large arena. Oh, the Chincana. Chincana, thank you. Right, right. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the tunnels. Obviously, I mean, the whole of South America has got tunnel myth. And right. It's connected to uh, the Inca and the pre-Inca. Mm -hmm. Tell me about tunnels you've seen. Well, yeah, there are a lot of esoteric stories about tunnels existing. Um, they all seem to lead to Cusco, which is interesting. <laughs> so there's one at a place called Amaru Muru on Lake Titicaca that leads there. The portal, the gateway. Exactly, the portal. There's also one at uh, Tiwanaku. Um, and there is one definitely that goes from the Chincana, which is at Sacsayhuaman, about two miles. Um, it, there's supposed to be 160 stairs that go down, and then the tunnel is easy, like you can easily walk through it. And then that winds up in the heart center of uh, Cusco underneath the Coricancha. The trouble is that the Coricancha is controlled by the Catholic Church, and so there's no access whatsoever. And the access at Sacsayhuaman has been blocked by the government because they don't want foolish tourists to go inside, get lost, and sue the government. But the last time I was in Cusco, which was about uh, two months ago, I think, I found the entrance uh, because they did take a lot of fill and try to fill the whole thing in. But by taking a flashlight, you can still s look in, and it's very, it goes in very deep. Um, so that shows me evidence that the indigenous stories of these tunnels existing are true. But the Inca didn't make them because they're through solid stone. They're an example of one of the earlier cultures that existed before the Inca, the megalithic mega builders, you would call them, who yeah. had technology that we still can't figure out. Let, let's talk about that a little bit because, I mean, I, again, I've been fascinated with it for a long time, as, as I know you have. Um, and I don't think anything prepares you quite for the enormity of Saxe Woman. To arrive there, to see these astonishingly huge stones put together and not even in irregular shapes, but just with such precision is quite mind-boggling. I, in fact, I would defy any modern construction engineer to come up with something like that today. What, what's your take on that? Well, the funny thing is that I was at Stonehenge four hours ago, and it's amazing to look at, just the scale. Uh, it's more impressive than I remember from 20 years ago. And of course, I've been looking at megalithic things, you know, full bore for the last five years. But it is amazing in terms of the scale and the fact that many of the stones were brought in from Wales. But they're not precise in terms of construction. There are no flat surfaces, whereas at a place like Sacsayhuaman, you have this jigsaw pattern of monstrous blocks, the largest being, one of them is 29 feet tall, only 17 feet is above the surface because 12 feet is the foundation underneath, and each stone is different in shape and they all interlock again, not perfectly, but so precisely that in many cases you can't fit a human hair in between. And beyond that, what we also learn is that 
they form pictograms. It's like a jigsaw puzzle of animal shapes. Uh, so I remember seeing some of this in, in, your, in your film, those which, which I found fascinating, absolutely fascinating to see. And when it's highlighted, if you're not looking for it, the chances of spotting it are pretty remote. But to see uh, the snake, to see uh, these other shapes that are laid in, that once it pointed out, mm -hmm. you can see them quite clearly. But, and the other thing that struck me as well, uh, when I was at um, Machu Picchu, in certain areas, I guess through seismic activity, some of the rocks have, despite the very high build quality, they have come away, they have broken. And you get to see behind the dressed surface. And you would expect, like any other stonemason, they'll work at the front, but at the back, nobody's too bothered. Oh no, behind you see they're exactly as tight and smooth and close fitting in the areas that you don't see as they ju are just at the front. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for me, that's, that's mind boggling. It's baffling how, not only how, but why mm -hmm. would somebody go to those lengths? Well, exactly. And the thing is that the more I've done the research, the more you can see that what the Inca did is they tried to replicate that. Yes. But technically they couldn't because they didn't have the technology. And no one on earth using bronze chisels and stone hammers, whether it's today or a thousand years ago, could possibly make with uh, again the Cori Cancha being the classic example where you have a wall three feet thick and what we know is because the wall has been broken in places that it's seamless from the front to the back and all the way in between. If, if the stones were off by, if there was a bump of, of possibly two millimeters then that stone would pivot but these are completely seamless and technically impossible with bronze uh, chisels and stone hammers. So the Inca could not, nor could we, using those tools, have built it. So the question is how, and that's why I brought engineers to Cusco to look at it and ask them, like, what tools do we have that could do it? And in general, they say, yes, we could make them, but the amount of time and the cost would be, you know, prohibitive or horrific. They're looking more towards theoretical tools, that, which we don't have, using vibrational or sound technology. That it's possible that these ancient people were able to shape the stone. It sounds like science fiction, but by softening it, not by heating it, but simply by changing the molecular structure temporarily. Mm -hmm. So by what you do is it's almost like softening two marshmallows or taking two marshmallows and being able to push them so that they meld together mm -hmm and then they, not solidify, but then they go back to their normal state. I that, mean... That, no, no, that has, that has resonance for me, absolutely. And, and indeed, when, when, when I was at uh, Tambo, that's very much the conclusion I drew too. And one of the things that kind of spoke to that for me is if you, if you look at them in profile, you'll see that the, the fascias of those rocks are bulging at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if you were to do that, if you could find a way for instance, of making this rock more malleable, as you say, like a marshmallow, very nice analogy. Uh -huh. um, and then let it sit in place, and indeed you've got others on top, then yes, the weight, combined weight is going to do exactly that. It's going to push them down, out, make them butt up against, but you will get a little bulge at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that, the physical evidence is there. And you also, of course, get these ones where they have these anomalous little tabs sticking out of them. Now, if, if we're looking at traditional construction methods, who in their right mind is going to go to the lengths of making a stone fit and then carving these little tabs, which means taking the whole of the rest of the face ship back? Yeah. It makes no sense. <clears throat> or are you re referring to the little knobs that stick out? Yeah, these little yeah, knob, <clears throat> knob things. Well, the conventional story is that the knobs were put there so that they could wrap a rope around it, and that would have an, you know, a, an attachment point whereby you could lift the stones up. But then... What you do is you look at the entire wall and you'll see that only certain ones, sometimes the largest ones don't have the knobs. Yeah. And so you, you go back to the conventional archaeologist and say, what about that? And they'll say, well, they removed the knobs after they finished the wall. And I say, well, why didn't they get rid of all of them? Because if, if you're working on a level of precision where you're so finely fitting stones together, yeah. sheerly out of aesthetics, you would remove any surface blobs or protrusions like that. So again, that's, you know, it, the conventional answers are becoming more and more comical the more that we do the research. And it's not to say that uh, the archaeologists are stupid, it's just that they seem to be afraid to approach the idea that there was 
or were uh, civilizations prior to ours that were more technically sophisticated than us. In, 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 in any avenue, I mean, even if it's only in stonemasonry, that seems, as you say, very, very difficult for, for traditional archaeology to accept. And I think, I think you've hit the nail squarely on the head. I think that's exactly what it's about. Because they're not stupid people. No. But these are people who have invested their entire lives in a fixed paradigm that if they want to carry on getting paid and get their, their professorship, then they better not rock the boat. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that's precisely what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, what next for you then? What do you want to go back and do? We want to look, you want to look at the written record. You want to maybe pursue one of these tunnels? Uh, yeah, definitely I, I want to do that. It's just every time I visit Machu Picchu or any of these sites, I always see things that I haven't seen before. Mm. And it's more as well to get whatever other indigenous knowledge that is left, uh, you know, that I can find, whether it means, you know, are, are there things like secret societies of native people still who are trying to, who are the holders of, of the, the sacred information, I'm not sure. The main thing I want to do is to show more and more people, Peruvians as well as non-Peruvians, the obvious nature of the fact that we're looking at at least two civilizations prior to the Inca who were technically superior and who disappeared. And the question is, how long ago are we looking? Are we looking prior to the end of the Ice Age, which I suspect we are? And that gives us evidence, along with what is being seen in Egypt, that there could have been a global culture or more than one global culture preceding the age of the Bible, preceding the age of the Sumerians, before the end of the Ice Age that were in some ways more sophisticated than us. Um, and what it tells us is human history in general is much richer than we think it is, much richer than what we've been taught. And as a human family, that should give us pride because the Inca structures, pre-Inca structures, Egyptian structures, I think, belong to all of us. They're not the domain of one, um, one country or one people. It's a human legacy. No, I agree entirely. I, I couldn't fault you that. And I, my feelings precisely on the matter. Um, just to try to nail a date to it, I mean, uh, are you prepared to stick your neck out and put a date on any, either of these pre-Incan cultures? Uh, at this point, I can't really, but the more, uh, the more that I look into it, um, the more I'm looking into the fact that uh, the end of the Ice Age was very dramatic mm -hmm. and very literally earth-shattering. Mm -hmm. The work of Graham Hancock is excellent in this, mm -hmm. as well as Barbara Hanclough. And what they're saying is that approximately 12,000 years ago, either a meteor struck the Earth or a comet came very close and alter the axis of the planet because I've been not been able to find out why our planet is at 23.5 degrees tilt. Um, a lot of the indigenous wisdom from around the world tells us stories of the sky falling, meaning that it's possible that our planet originally spun perfectly around, but because of some kind of impact, it was rapidly twisted by as much as 23.5 degrees. That caused the poles uh, to melt very rapidly, earthquake activity. Um, within a thousand years, the oceans rose by 350 feet, um, sink or burying a lot of um, amazing evidence under the oceans. Um, so I, I think we're definitely looking pre-end of the Ice Age. And that, I think, is what we're looking for when we talk about Atlantis, not a continent that sank, but the fact that land which was once above the ocean sank below the ocean as a result of 350 foot sea rise. Oh, yeah, I would agree with that entirely. Are, are you familiar with the, with the work of Charles Hapgood? Yes. Okay, again, that, that's something that really spoke to me and I think that that's, doesn't run contrary to anything that uh, uh, Hancock or Barbara Hancock are, are talking about. I think it actually is entirely complementary. And the notion that some cataclysmic event could move the entire surface in one go mm -hmm. works for me as an idea and it would go to, a long way to explaining stuff. Um, sites all over the world um, from um, Tiwanaku and Machu Picchu through to Giza, Stonehenge, the White Pyramids in, in, uh, in China are very similar in that they exhibit uh, extraordinary construction skills, often archaic ast astronomical alignments. Um, why do you think that they are so similar? Are we looking at uh, the legacy of a global culture? Do you think that's likely? 
Um, I believe so, but not necessarily just one global culture. Um, it's possible there was contact between Peru and Egypt, um, pre-dynastic Egypt. Uh, some of the building styles are very similar, and I'm a sailor, so I've been studying wind and current patterns around the world, and how difficult would, would it have been for people, even with a very simple large ship, sailing ship, to travel around the world. And it, it's not that difficult. Um, we're just brainwashed into the idea that um, Columbus was the first great adventurer. You know, stories from many different cultures talk about their ancestors having come from other lands by, you know, not th from flying saucers, but by sea. Um, so I think that's definitely what we're looking at. And the thing is that if you look at the, the global pattern of major uh, currents, what you can see is a very pivotal, uh, pivotal little place, land uh, place in southern Mexico, which is where the Olmec civilization lived. It's a very narrow point of land between the Pacific and Atlantic. The Olmecs are a very mysterious culture. They probably were the ones responsible for the so-called Mayan calendar that quote-unquote ends uh, on the 21st of December. But that little land bridge area there would have meant there would only be about a hundred miles difference between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And I think that was key, uh, a key point of transport between those two oceans because no one would bother traveling all the way down the east coast of South America and all the way up the west coast um, when you could simply jump across that land bridge and probably build another ship on the other side mm -hmm. using local materials. Anyone who is a, any great um, maritime civilization, aboard the ships you wouldn't simply have sailors, you would also have carpenters. So I think in that way um, Peru and ancient Egypt could have been connected as well as through the Red Sea. There are a lot of ancient, um, ancient stories about uh, tr uh, people moving through the, the, uh, the Red Sea into the Pacific and, and going eastward. Mm -hmm. So that's something else I'm, I'm exploring. And of course, if you, if you are wanting to navigate <coughs> over vast sea distances, you need primarily two things. You need to have so something to sight from, so stars, the sun. Exactly. Uh, and you also need to have an accurate measurement of time. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen any of the evidence to point at the time measurement aspect of ancient uh, maritime culture? No, I think, actually I think it's more, uh, we think of the need, th or that there's a need for chronometers and the need to know longitude. I think, I think uh, that they simply did a lot of island hopping. Okay. So point to point, because what you need is, is you need a place to stop at once in a while for you know, fresh water and food, etc. And I think that's where Easter Island, which uh, the native people call Rapa Nui, is very pivotal. That was the, some of my latest research is connecting the west coast of Peru with Polynesia because of this red-haired characteristic which shows up on the west coast of, of Peru in ancient times as well as throughout Polynesia. I think they're the same bloodline of ancient red-haired sea kings. Which leads me very neatly into the elongated skulls. Ah. Um, talk to me about that. Well, that's something, uh, David Childress and I published a book in early February uh, called The Enigma of Cranial Deformation. Uh, David was convinced that many cultures around the world, for some reason, the nobility would change the shape of their children's skulls in order to generally elongate them. And so the question is, where on earth could we find this? Uh, were there relationships between these people? And why would people do this? What we generally found is the reasoning behind is that these ancient diverse people thought that it made the children more intelligent, uh, was beautiful, and because their ancestors looked like that. That's very interesting. And, and automatically people think of aliens, which is possible. But what I've been looking more at lately is because I've been living in Paracas, which is uh, south of Lima, that's where we find what seem to be natural shaped elongated skulls. Um, I just sent DNA samples to the United States to a man called Lloyd Pye of the Star Child Project. And so he's going to analyze both carbon-14 dating and also DNA test five different skull samples in order wow. to tell us how old the skulls actually are and hopefully the, the, um, the ancestry of the skulls because no one's ever done that in Peru. Um, because I'm right in, right in thinking, I believe, that on the basis of the star child skull DNA analysis, it's finally concluded that it, 
that it includes DNA strands that are not found in any other database in the world. Is that correct? Yeah, not, not only um, are there strands that don't exist in any human, there are databases that, that don't exist in any life form on Earth, yeah. and that's developing conclusive evidence of alien contact. It's very difficult to, to, to draw any other conclusion. That's certainly the case. So, so what about the red-haired connection then? Because that's a recessive gene, is it not? It is, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite rare. Um, the thing is, the Paracas people just suddenly seem to appear in the area at least 3,000 years ago. But again, through, you know, we have to do carbon-14 to find out how old they are. But where would this characteristic have come from? Because native people of the Americas always have black hair. They would need genetic input from somewhere else in order to develop or have this red hair characteristic. Um, Paracas is right on the Pacific Ocean, and again, ancient seafarers could have traveled from another part of the world and at some point have interbred with these people. And that's something to take into account whenever you look at any civilization, is that there is no one source. Even in, in a simple example like England, you have the Angles, the Saxons, the Normans, the Romans, the Celts, the pre-Celts, etc. <clears throat> that, of course, would be the case in, in probably any part of the world, is that there would always be genetic input over time um, through warfare or also just through people traveling. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I, ha I honestly have no idea where, where the red-haired characteristic came from, but I'm starting to look possibly at the Phoenicians, who are great travelers, and also at the Sumerians, who are great great ocean travelers as well. And perhaps it's, it's, you know, it's worth considering the Olmecs too, because although the Olmecs, of course, have the, the Negroid features, there's nothing to say they didn't have red hair. And, if you, if you, and of course, you see red-haired Aboriginals from Australia. Mm -hmm. You see uh, red-haired uh, red Indigenous in uh, African tribes too. Uh -huh. So the correlation between those, possibly, obviously seafaring nations as well. Well, that's true. And, and also, red hair seems to de uh, denote mo uh, nobility in general. Mm -hmm. Because you find that amongst, uh, yeah, amongst many different cultures in the world, even the you know the red-haired mummies that have been found in China. Absolutely, and of course in Klaus's work, uh, Klaus uh, Klaus Donner, looking at some of the giant artifacts uh, and, and the giant, there, there seems to be a red-headed component in that too. Uh -huh. So there's a, there's certainly a theme going on there. So it's, it'd be very interesting to see where your work takes us next. I hope, yeah. I'm. This is just ongoing for me. I'm. I'm having the time of my life with this. You know, I'm. I'm like a, a kid in a global candy store. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to wrap things up now by um, drawing uh, inevitably on. Uh, we find ourselves in the uh, in the hallowed year of 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, a few short months away from the uh, cataclysmic 21st of December, uh, the end of the mile long count. Um, assuming we're all still here on the 22nd of December, um, what do you see for 2013 and beyond? Well, the thing is that I've been involved with Native people all my life since I was a child. And so, um, and in, like, fortunately, that gives me a network of people through which I've been able to, um, to know and be in contact with. Uh, being involved with Native people is kind of a fad thing or a, uh, like, the thing to do now, but when I was a child, it was very much something that people told me I shouldn't do because they were Indians and I'm not. So I know what some of the actual Mayan elders say. Unfortunately, a lot of books have been written by Western people based on very few facts um, and are very sensational in saying that the world comes to an end. Whereas in fact, what the Mayan elders, you know, they've been misrepresented because when they talk about the world, they're talking about a world being a time period, like the first world, second world, third world, fourth world, fifth world, being a cycle of time. So yes, in fact, what they're saying is that this present world comes to an end, but what they're saying is it's a cycle that ends. It's not the end of the world. And what they're offended by is the fact that um, most of the authors have got everything, uh, everything completely wrong. What they're saying, from what I've heard, is that we're coming to the end of an age of darkness, the end of a world of darkness into a world of light. So it's actually the 22nd will be better than the 21st, and I think we're going into a golden age and not into the destruction of, of our planet. 
but modern people love sensationalism and especially I think North Americans but maybe everybody likes to be scared and so as people count down the days I think they should be looking forward to the future and not being in fear of it. Brian Foster, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, thank you Jonathan.